Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, April 25th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight. Can you guess the reason that GOP voter turnout is up more than 60% since 2012? Then, more Christian migrants are denied entry around the globe. After that, a city experiments with ground-level traffic devices, so you never have to look up from your phone. And a 9-11 first responder points out the flaws in the official story. That's next. The fire department doesn't have the training to pull a building, to demo a building like that. We're not trained to do that. We've never done that in my 32 years. I know of no evolution whatsoever that does that. Well, Obama is in the midst of a European trip. Now, you know, it could be even funnier than National Lampoon's European vacation. Definitely bigger budget. But it's not funny because of what's at stake. Now, he has gone to Britain first. He did that at the end of last week, lecturing them about the Brexit campaign, the British exit from the EU. Now, the campaign started April the 15th. He was there less than one week later. They're not going to vote until June the 23rd. But he was there cajoling and threatening the British people. And I wonder, when I looked at this, I thought about the many times we've had foreign leaders come in and interject themselves into our election recently about Donald Trump. Why? Because of the same issues that Obama is interjecting himself into the British election for. And typically, you would think that they would not welcome foreign intrusion in their elections. And this is very unprecedented. We haven't seen this cross uh, semination of politicians in these elections before, but it's because of the globalism that is involved. That's why we're seeing these leaders come from one country to the other and interfere in our elections, our president going to Britain and interfering in their elections. That's what's behind it. You know, we see the Democrats, we see the Republicans, we see the UK politicians all welcoming that as well. Why? because they all work for the same masters. Now, let's take a look at what happened here. Of course, there was a couple of different things that happened in Britain. Uh, he threatened uh, Britain, and we'll talk about that threat here. But after he did that, he urged young people, in the most recent uh, appearance that he had in Britain before he went to Germany, he urged young people there not to pull back from the world. Oh, okay. Not to pull back from the globalism is what he's talking to them about. So it comes a day after the president faced a furious backlash from many in the UK warning Britain over leaving the EU, saying the US wants the UK as part of a strong Europe. And this is coming from the Daily Mail in the UK. They quote him as saying, our problems are man-made, so they can be solved by man. He's quoting JFK saying that. And man needs to be as brave as he wants. Well, you know, the man-made problems that we have really are government-made. Okay, and there's, that's what we're going to be talking about is what these problems are. It's the globalism. That's the man-made problems that we're facing. He says, you're a generation that has seen globalization not as a threat, but as an opportunity for education, employment, and exchange. Not as a curse, but as a gift. Hey, you know what? The Trojan horse was a gift as well. And we've already seen what's inside of it. We've already had the European Union. We've already had NAFTA. We've already seen the first group of troops come out of the Trojan horse, and we see them running to the gate to let in the rest of the army. We know precisely what is going on. Don't tell us this is about economic opportunity. We've already seen the results of your economic opportunity. We've already seen the results of your globalism, your open borders. Now, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, has come down on the side advocating an exit from the EU by Britain. And he took on Barack Obama, and was criticized by his own party because he's talked about the fact that Obama was loyal to his Kenyan ancestors, and one of the first things that he did, and this is a fact, is he got rid of the Churchill bust, okay? But he had some more interesting things to say that nobody else is talking about. Now, they say, and this, again, this is Daily Mail, Boris Johnson launched an astonishing attack on Barack Obama's ridiculous and weird, is the way he characterized it, arguments for Britain to stay in the EU. And he also took on, mocked the controversial claim that an Anglo-U.S. trade would be hit hard by a Brexit. Now, 
What we're seeing here is blackmailing and interference, and he calls it out on this. And I want to focus not on the comments about Churchill. We'll mention that briefly, but listen to what he really said. This is what uh, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, said, who, was, who uh, made the comments about uh, Obama. He said, it's ridiculous to warn that the UK will be at the back of a queue, back of a line for a free trade deal. He said the UK has never been able to do a free trade deal with the US in the last 43 years because we're in the EU. Any negotiations are entirely in the hands of the European Commission. Only 3.6% of the commission officials actually come from Britain. So he says negotiations that we would normally have with the US, right? Those kind of negotiations are held up by absurd problems like French restrictions on Hollywood movies or Greek hostility to American feta cheese. So what he's talking about is the fact that we don't have a trade relation, relationship with the United States because the EU has interjected itself in order to manage the British economy and in order to manage the American economy as well to some degree. That's what we're going to see with this globalism. It is not free trade. It is not increased opportunity. It is management of your economy by people that you have absolutely no control over, who you don't even know who they are. And he goes on to say, the crucial thing that Churchill stood for, that America stands for today, is representative democracy. Now, in an article on The New American, where they talk about the TPP, and they talk about the reams of regulation, they point out British voters are getting set for a national referendum in June that will decide whether they leave the European Union or they stay in. There's many issues driving the British exit vote. EU spending, EU taxes, EU regulations, EU bailouts, EU corporate uh, corruption, EU usurp usurpation of power, and EU migration, okay? And you sum it all up, it's you, EU. <laughs> it stinks, okay? <laughs> That's what it really is. And, and the bottom line is, look, this is precisely what's going on. When you control spending, taxes, regulation, bailouts, corruption, well, of course they control the corruption, power and migration, you control everything, and they have lost their sovereignty. That's the bottom line. And so the question is, as they try to move forward in consolidation, global consolidation, they're starting to unravel from the back end because people have seen what is happening with this. Here's one more comment. This is coming from the Daily Mail. Uh, Norman Lamont talks about the president's shameful bid to bully Britain. He says, let me say at the outset, I'm an admirer of Obama, but if Obama is wisely cautious about intervention in the Middle East, why on earth does he think it appropriate to blunder into Britain's referendum on the EU? He says the president insists that he has a stake in the referendum debate because of his country's sacrifice in the war. Kind of reminds me of the old movie, uh, White Christmas, with Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye, remember? Uh, every time he wants something after the war from Bing Crosby, he kind of holds his arm and says, oh, you know, I, I saved you from that falling wall. You know, you owe me. Oh, that's what? That's the cards that Obama is actually playing in Britain. Besides threatening them, you're going to get at the back of the line. You're not going to have any trade. Then he talks about the tens of thousands of U.S. servicemen who rest in cemeteries, okay? You know what? The real issue is, and it's not even Obama pulling their strings, okay? You have to understand who is pulling Obama's strings. Look at the way this played out in Germany. He goes to Germany. What is he greeted with in Germany? Muslim migrants in Germany chanting Adolf Hitler and Allo Akbar, okay? So uh, that is the ultimate no-no in, in Britain. You don't chant Heil Hitler, okay? Nothing brings down the wrath of society, and rightfully so, in Germany, than to shout Heil Hitler. But no, no criticism of the Muslims who are doing that. Is that inclusive? Is that inclusive to shout Heil Hitler? Was he about inclusivity? Was he about tolerance? No. You see, this is about shutting down society, and the government in Germany that would basically fine or lock up people who did that if they were Germans allow that from the people that they're bringing in. Look at what the Pope does. The Pope goes to a refugee camp, uh, people who are coming from Syria, and he talks to a Christian brother and sister who had escaped Syria. And he promises them that he's going to take them to Italy. Instead, he took three Muslim families, 12 people, and he left the Christians behind. Because you know, it would be so politically incorrect to take the Christians because then people would say you're playing favorites. But it's okay to play favorites with the Muslims, to take 12 people into the Vatican to show how inclusive and how caring the Pope is.
But today in Germany, Obama praised Chancellor Merkel as being on the right side of history because of her welcoming refugee policy. Maybe he should have, what he meant to say was she was on the Reich side of history because her immigrants are shouting Heil Hitler. He said it demonstrated real political and moral leadership. There you go. And letting in more than 1.1 million people who are fleeing war and misery. She's giving voice to the kinds of principles that bring people together rather than divide them. People are understanding that was what really is happening here is not bringing people together, but this truly is a divide and conquer policy. Now they go on to say that uh, Der Spiegel criticizes Obama because they say, you know, she should have told him that America needs to take more because per capita, Germany is taking a bigger hit than we are. And it said, then maybe she would not have needed to call on the Turkish president Erdogan to help her. Remember the Turkish president who she is paying back evidently by jailing a German comedian who mocked the Turk. So meanwhile, this compassionate Turkish leader is allowing all the Christian churches in one city to be confiscated. Yet don't make fun of him. And if you do make fun of him, Angela Merkel will jail the comic that does, but she'll tolerate the Muslims shouting Heil Hitler and Allah Akbar. Now, they talk, the, talk about how this is affecting her, even though Obama likes this, the people in Germany don't. They see through this hypocrisy. And of course, she's seen her support drop to 33%, the lowest level in five years. Meanwhile, support for a what they call a right-wing populist anti-immigration party, the alternative for Germany, has surged to around 14%. Is it really right-wing? You know, they use that term to make them sound like the Nazis when it's Merkel's immigrants who are shouting Heil Hitler. Look at what's going on in Austria. The Austrian far right party. This is again, they're doing the far right, the right wing. Triumphs in a presidential poll. They say it could spell turmoil. This is from The Guardian. They say Austria is braced for political turmoil with fears that a landslide victory for a right wing populist gun carrying candidate and Sunday's first round of presidential votes could trigger snap elections. Now. They say this is largely a ceremonial role. He has threatened to make use of the right to dissolve parliament before the 2018 elections. And he says, you'll be surprised at what can be done, however, by an Austrian president. Now, what makes him right wing, according to The Guardian, according to all of the uh, European press? Well, here's the anti-immigration, Euroskeptic. In other words, he doesn't like the European Union. Feels like he's getting a bad deal. Feels like immigration is a bad deal. Even though they say he has leftist stances on welfare issues. So you see, you can even be a socialist in terms of economics, but if you don't like open borders and if you don't like the globalist government, you are a far right extremist. Now, meanwhile, we see that in the United States, just as I was talking about before, it's the elites, of course, that love uh, the globalism. And as the Wall Street Journal points out, campaigns, this presidential campaign's populist tone is rankling America's CEOs. Why? Because it's anti-business rhetoric, they say. Really? What is anti-business rhetoric? Well, if you take a look at what they say, anti-business rhetoric is anything that would quote, according to the Wall Street Journal, thwart any, any immigration overhaul or derail a sweeping 12-nation trade pact the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So if you oppose open borders, if you oppose the globalist trade deals, you are labeled by the Wall Street Journal and America's CEOs as anti-business. Because see, their business is globalism. Their business is a one world government. We're reminded that again by Charles Koch coming out this weekend and saying, well, I think Clinton would be a better president than a Republican. Why? Because he knows that Hillary Clinton will support the business agenda of globalism, of open borders, and these trade treaties that were written by the multinational corporations. He says it's possible, it's possible that a Hillary Clinton presidency would be better than putting in a Republican back in the White House. He said, we would have to believe that her actions would be quite different than her rhetoric, but let me put it that way, that it would be possible. And he said Clinton was in some ways better than Bush. Look, the Koch brothers, contributed to Hillary Clinton's campaign. And we're supposed to believe that they're totally on the side of the GOP establishment. And truly they are, because the GOP establishment itself would rather see Hillary Clinton in as president than an outsider like Trump, who is opposed to their globalist agenda. And we see the same thing from Rupert Murdoch, who pretends that he runs a conservative news media organization, which occasionally does take conservative sides, but also 
supports Hillary Clinton. What is this all about? Well, here's a quote, and this is from the New American, an article talking about trilateralist power policies. Go back to this quote from Senator Barry Goldwater, 1979, from his memoir with no apologies, and here's how he lays it down. In my view, the Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power. What have we been talking about? Political, monetary, intellectual, that's the press, and ecclesiastical, there's the Pope for you, okay? What the trilaterals truly intend is the creation of a worldwide economic power superior to the political governments of the nation states involved, okay? And as creators of the system, they will rule the world. He warned us about this back in 1979, we now see it happening. Can people see the decades old trilateral plan and resist it? You know, for the first time we've had massive public awareness of the secret 28 pages of the 9-11 report, thanks to Donald Trump. What if the public became as aware of Building 7? When we come back, we've got a filmmaker and a firefighter who ask, how would that change the risks for firefighters? Stay with us. Joining me now is a documentary filmmaker from the UK as well as a firefighter. They're very concerned about something that happened in America 15 years ago. You know, we've had the missing 28 pages. Many people ask, how did we go this long without even knowing there was a missing 28 pages? Well, there were a lot of us who were talking about it, a small core of people who were pushing that issue. Now it has gone to national attention, thanks to Donald Trump focusing on it. What is going to be the breakthrough to get us to look at what happened with the third building on 9-11, Building 7, World Trade Center Building 7? Joining us now are Brian Maxwell, an Edinburgh firefighter with 15 years experience with the Scottish Fire and Rescue. He resigned over his treatment by senior officers following a brief three-minute appearance in a documentary by the filmmaker. Also joining us, Tony Rook and his film, Incontrovertible. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Hi, David. Uh, tell us uh, a little bit about why you, uh, let's start with Brian. Brian, why as a Scottish uh, firefighter would you put your job on the line and essentially lose your job over something that happened in America 15 years ago? I think that, um, I think we've got a common bond across the pond here between the UK and the United States. and. Uh, they, uh, the, they both went to war um, for the, the same reasons they gave us all. Um, and uh, it, it basically, it's a conscience-driven decision that I made to, uh, to pursue this, this issue. Yes, yes. And, and tell us what about the official story, either one of you can uh, answer this, what about the official story uh, that they're telling us is something that concerns you? Um, I mean, where do you want to start? I mean, it concerns me that it took over 400 days for the initial investigation to get going. I mean, my father was a, um, a, a, a detective. Uh, I think if you went into a police station and said, said a, a, a relative of yours had been murdered, and they said, well, we're going to take 400 days before we start investigating this thing, that, that would bother me to begin with. Yes. Um, but the, the fact that, and I don't mean any disrespect to the American people here, David, but your government have um, a previous history of, of planning to kill their own people. And I think when you look at 9-11 in any, any kind of detail, um, it's, it's, it, it, the, the whole scenario doesn't smell very nice. And uh, when you start studying Building 7, which is what I started to do around about 2005, 2006, it, 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 it began to concern me very, very much. And, and as, as the years went by, people like Brian, um, who we're talking with tonight, um, obviously became very concerned as well. Um, and that's that's just, a, you know, the tip of the iceberg. There's there's so many things that, that are extremely troubling about the whole story. Brian, uh, tell us what the official story is in terms of why Building 7 collapsed, because I think many people don't realize that we had two planes and three buildings that collapsed that day. Tell us what they're telling us officially as to why it collapsed. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're telling us officially um, that uh, this building came down due to normal office-type fires. Um, and even that isn't well publicised. Uh, what's the reason for that? Why haven't they Why haven't they promoted and publicised that as a safety issue? Um, we're not getting it. We're just not getting it. Um, yeah, and I think that's why Tony's made the documentary that he's made, because that is one of the issues in the documentary. 
And I think that's the key issue here is that if they're telling us that normal office fires caused this steel frame building to fall down, the only one in history that that's ever happened, if that were true, then we need to ask what is being done to eliminate this risk in the future? Where are the studies that we need to uh, see about this to, to help us to uh, engineer buildings differently, to fight fires differently? Yeah, I mean, these are the, these are the questions that remain un unanswered at the moment. So we, we need to push this issue, uh, which as I have been doing uh, up until I left the fire service, um, without much success, unfortunately. Um, the the promotion of the the actual documentary and the pushing of the issues um, it didn't get the kind of galvanising effect upon firefighters that I kind of or, or maybe I was naive in believing that that it, you know there would be some kind of um, uh, response positive response in this regard um, that just didn't happen unfortunately. Now. You appeared for just three minutes in this documentary. Uh, your supervisors, your senior supervisors, uh, disciplined you for, quote, operating outside the parameters of your employer's code of conduct. Wouldn't you think that the senior firefighting officials would be concerned if there was a new vulnerability for skyscrapers that had been uncovered with the collapse of Building 7 from normal fires? Wouldn't you think they would want to know about that? You, yeah, yeah, uh, it's 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 a good point. Um, the during the investigation, they weren't interested in the content of the DVD. They weren't interested in the message. They were only interested in looking at my misdemeanors, um, and they were correct. They 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 did what they had to do. Uh, I I was operating out with the parameters of the code of conduct uh, unwittingly at the time. Um, and I was I was quite rightly disciplined, you know, mm. um, but uh, but the, the, they've completely not paid any regard or addressed the safety issue, which is something that, that needs to be promoted and pushed. You know, uh, Tony, in the press release that you sent me, you pointed to a February 2016 YouGov poll, which said that when 49% of those people who saw the collapse of Building 7 doubted the official report, 27% had doubts. So it's only a quarter of the people who looked at that and said, yeah, I could believe that it could all just collapse on its own weight like that. Uh, but 75% of the people did not believe it. When I look at this, and when I look at what's happening with the secret, uh, the classified 28 pages that were redacted, I'm reminded that the truth can lie hidden for a very long time until a determined group of people finally expose it. And this happened really, I believe, because Donald Trump raised the issue because we'd had members who sat on the 9-11 Commission, senior senators who were the chair of the uh, Select Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Bob Graham, who'd been a former governor of Florida as well, had been working on this, had been trying to bring this to the attention of the public since this happened. I uh, said, so we need to see, the public needs to see these 28 pages so they understand some of the people that were complicit in this, and that's being hidden by our government, and yet he could not break through. This is a guy who was head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So I know that uh, Brian, uh, the firefighter, gets a lot of pushback from his fire department when he starts to talk about 9-11 because everybody wants to just pull back and say, hey, that's the official story. We're not going to look at it. But I think there's an opening here now that people have opened their mind, realize that something has been hidden for a very long time, perhaps they'll be willing to look at some of the implications of Building 7. Yeah, I, I think so, David. I mean, I think I, I said to you in a, in a communication before we did the interview that I feel that America is so big and so wonderfully patriotic. I'm, I'm tempted to use, you to use the word idiotically patriotic. And, 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 and we are in England as well. We just had the Queen's birthday the other day. She's 90 years old and the whole country is up in, up in, a, you know, um, in, in joyous arms about the fact the Queen is 90. But I, I think that the zeitgeist is changing. Um, I've, I've not obviously seen the 28 redacted pages unless it says, you know, that we did it. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in them, to be brutally honest. <laughs> so I, I think, um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there is there is a sea change happening. And, mm. and, and what I'm concerned about, I, I, I've looked into, um, since making the film Incontrovertible and since, you know, Brian and I got together, um, 
it, it, is, is, is there something we can actually sort of pin down? Um, and I'm not sure there is. But, but in England, for, for American fire services, sorry, is there something we can pin down with American fire services where you can go on strike or industrial action? I don't know what you call it in America. We call it going on strike in England. Yeah, um, where, we do. Where they down tools and, and, and they stop working. I'm not sure that would happen in England either, but it does happen here quite a lot. And Hang on, Tony. We're going to have to take a, a break, and we're going to be right back. We're going to talk about what can be done, and we're also going to talk about truly the implications that no one is talking about for the safety of the public and for the safety of firefighters. But, of course, this information has to be kept secret for our safety. That's always what they tell us. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking to filmmaker Tony Rook of the UK. And of course, if you want to see his documentary, Incontrovertible, you can see that at incontrovertible 911 evidence.co.uk. You can see it there for free or you can purchase it to share. We're also talking to Brian Maxwell, an experienced Edinburgh firefighter with 15 years experience who resigned after being disciplined for questioning the official story uh, in a three minute clip in this documentary. Gentlemen, when we look at this, uh, the parallels, I think, in terms of how we unfold this truth, you just said in the last segment, Tony, that you don't really care what's in the secret 28 pages unless they say, sorry, we did it. That's true. There's so many different questions. There's questions from engineers. There's questions uh, from uh, flight, uh, from pilots who have questions about the official story. Let's focus on what's going on with Building 7 and the implications for firefighters if a minor fire can drop this building. Now, in your documentary, you said this would change everything that the way the firefighters would fight fires, according to one of the firefighters there. He says, we go into the building, we set up a base right below the, uh, the floor that's on fire, and we work from there. Is it going to collapse on us suddenly in seven seconds and free fall? Well, I mean, Brian could probably answer this question better than I. I'm not a firefighter, David, but um, yeah, um, Adrian Mallet, who's who's one of the firefighters we interview in the film, d d does state that you know categorically. That's what you do. You go into a, the floor below the fire. You set up a bridgehead. Uh, you send up breathing apparatus teams, uh, water jets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we have been told by NIST, you know, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, that. You know these these composite beams, you know, hooked up to um, uh, 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 joining fixtures, column seventy nine, famously, are extremely susceptible to uh, thermal expansion, and and they can you know unseat themselves, they can fall apart, and then they create this domino effect where the whole thing can come down. And um, so let's go with the official story. I mean, if that's the case, then any firefighter in their right mind wouldn't go into a high-rise building and, and fight a high-rise fire because it could fall down on their head very, very quickly. Exactly. I, I mean, you know. Exactly. And, and the question is, you know, when we look at the missing 28 pages and the allegations that this shows close ties to the Saudi government and the efforts to allow 9-11 families to then sue the Saudi government for compensation, where are the lawsuits for this building? I mean, is this a building that was not designed up to standards? Is it unique? Because we haven't seen any other steel frame buildings that have collapsed. So what is it about this building that is so unique if we're going to go with the official story? And why haven't we seen any lawsuits uh, from 9-11 families? Why hasn't anybody sued them for malpractice? Because they were supposed to design these buildings to be hit by airplanes. Yet this one collapsed even when it wasn't hit by an airplane. I, I, I completely agree with you. I'm assuming that's a rhetorical question. I mean, yeah. I, I was actually approached when we were doing um, Incontrovertible and, and the earlier stages of it and who I was going to interview in the US by um, a chap who's, whose name shall, shall remain nameless at the moment, whose father did the fireproofing of World Trade Center 7. He was disgusted that his, his father, who's, who's now deceased, was disgusted that the, that the building had fallen down because apparently the fireproofing wasn't good enough. Obviously, it fell down because of um, thermal expansion uh, and wanted to talk to me um, and we've yet to get together but uh, I, be I believe him to be genuine um, uh, look at the comments in the, in the film Incontrovertible from uh, uh, Professor Thomas in uh, the University of Victoria at Melbourne uh, and what he has to say about the, the theory the NIST has come forward with um, it's, it's not very credible to say the least David yep. 
what we've seen is basically NIST coming out and saying, sorry, it caught fire and just fell down. Well, where are the investigations? As you point out in your documentary, uh, you point out if this was an airplane where this had happened, you would have had the entire fleet of airplanes similar in design grounded until they had identified precisely how that had failed. We don't see that happening here even 15 years later. It's absolutely amazing. Mm. I know. and I, I mean, I'm not a firefighter. Brian is. And I can understand why Brian jacked his job in. What we're trying to do in, in, in the UK at the moment is, is because we're obviously a lot smaller country um, and we do, and, and the firefighting service over here are, are a little bit more, I don't think, I don't think it's militant. I just think, I think uh, legally we're allowed to do it a bit more. I've tried to research what firefighters are allowed to do in the US and it varies state by state. So it would seem can they go on strike for this? Can they go on strike for that? In England, firefighters are actually quite militant in in, in, in their own way, uh, pensions and, and, and pay and condition, all this kind of stuff. But if we can draw it to their attention that they are um, in grave danger of having a building fall down on top of them while they're fighting a fire, then hopefully that they, they might be able to do something to, to bring it to the attention of, of uh you know, the hierarchy and yes. ultimately government, which maybe they can't do in the U.S. I don't know. That's true. Well, you know, we always hear everybody talking about honoring the brave firefighters and policemen who gave their lives. Why don't we honor them by demanding an investigation to see what happened with this, to make sure that it isn't going to happen again? And quite mm -hmm. frankly, that investigation may show that the way that you keep this from happening again is not a a uh, engineering solution, but perhaps a political solution, I think, is what lies at the bottom of this. But you interviewed uh, Rudy Dent, somebody that we've also spoken to. Uh, Leanne McAdoo had an interesting interview with him in Times Square, somebody who was there when Building 7 collapsed. He said he and other firefighters winced when there was an explosion, just as you would react to that noise. Uh, he said that uh, he was absolutely amazed uh, at what happened, but he didn't speak out right away because he was in shock, essentially, from what had happened to his fellow firefighters. And then, essentially, he was also, for some time, he was concerned about his job. And, and Brian, I have to say to you, I, I really appreciate the integrity and the determination that you have to go to the wire with this, to stand up and say, I'm not going to, set, I'm not going to remain silent about something that I see as something that is a concern. I really appreciate you doing that. Thanks, David. Um, the, uh, the, when I wakened up to the reality of this event, it was very late in the day. It was, it was, two, it was 2010. Um, and uh, when I found out uh, all the information that had been withheld from us on the mainstream media, I, uh, I was in deep shock for, for, for a few weeks. Um, yes. It shook my foundations. And, uh, it, and th this is a really, to me, this is a really serious issue. And it's not something I'm going to step back from, from, from ever until we come get a satisfactory conclusion to this. And let's talk about some of the things that you're trying to do there in the UK. Now, besides the documentary Incontrovertible, you also have a petition that you're putting up. If you get 100,000 signatures, it will be discussed in Parliament. This is a petition to Theresa May uh, demanding an independent investigation into the deaths of 67 British citizens on 9-11. And of course, you're also making available a, uh, an 11 or 12 minute clip of your film, Incontrovertible. Uh, you've got a message to UK fi uh, firefighters saying, were you aware that any steel framed building is now susceptible to sudden and total collapse? I think that's a very important way to approach this, to go to the firefighters and to get them to uh, be concerned about this and look at this and say, is this truly a concern? Because you know, when I look at this, Brian, and I have to say that uh, the, the people in the establishment on both sides, perhaps they don't believe the official story or they would do an investigation, or are they that callous with firefighters' lives? I think, uh, in all honesty at the moment, I think uh, firefighters, police, military, we're all expendable, we're all replaceable, and that's the way they view us. There's no doubt about it. And certainly on the day of 9-11, I think that... Uh, 343 souls that, that, that lost their lives initially in the, the two towers um, that, you know, collapsed. Um, yes. They weren't expecting anything to happen other than to be in that, those buildings fighting fires. They yes. didn't expect those buildings to collapse. We, and, you know. 
We've only we got less than one minute. Uh, Tony, I want to end with you. Tell us uh, how people can proceed forward. Tell us a little bit about your film or what you would like them to do. Sign the petition, do whatever. Give us some some information about that. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for UK citizens, David, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure it applies to American citizens if they can just go to Incontrovertible, uh, you know, Incontrovertible, Tony Rook, they'll find the website. Um, there is there is a petition on there where, whereby they can sign uh, the, 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 the petition for safer buildings for firefighters. Well, um, never, but- never underestimate the power of persistence. We now see people openly questioning what they've been told about 9-11 with oh, the 28 gosh. pages. Oh, and I think that's the real key. Thank you. We're out of time. Sorry, Tony. Thank you so much for joining us. Tony Rook and Brian Maxwell. And you can see that film, Incontrovertible, and you can see it at incontrovertible911evidence.co.uk. 